Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Grace, the family and children's pastor here at Mosaic. And friends, I'm excited to share Kid City's Three Steps Forward with you. But before we jump into that, I wanna take us back to our 2020 One Thing, 40 chairs. Leading up to our One Thing, we counted every single chair in Kid City, and we envisioned filling each of those 40 chairs, inviting every family and every child to our table in our house. Now that vision is still at the heart of our ministry, but it's so much more than just filling our 40 chairs. It's about those children who fill those chairs, worshiping God together, learning God's word, discovering to love the Lord with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind, building community, developing a deep understanding of who they are and whose they are as beloved children of God. It's about discipleship. That means partnering with and empowering families and teaching their children how to walk with God. Now here's where our three steps forward come in. Minutes, moments, and milestones. These steps forward are how we equip and empower families in discipling their children with the minutes they already have, the moments that arise every day, and the milestones that you're already celebrating. Now, minutes. It's all about creating minutes. And minutes, they don't have to be big and complicated to be meaningful. It's all about building simple, intentional time into your rhythm of family life for the purpose of thinking about, talking about and living out the gospel. Minutes is where families create time to develop holy habits together. So think about reading the Bible, scripture memorization, praying, worshiping, and serving. It's not about shifting your family rhythm around to fit one big thing, but about using the time that you do have, like gathering around your dinner table, taking time together in the morning or before bed, just any time that you set out intentionally for discipleship. Now on the back of our Three Steps Forward card, you're gonna find our five big questions and our monthly Sunday series and the coordinating memory verses and the weekly Bible passage for that Sunday. So when you're planning your minutes, you can use that week's passage to shape your time together. Read the passage together. Use our five big questions to talk about it and close your time with prayer. So what if your family created space for minutes two or three days per week? I want that to be your challenge. Number two is moments. Discipleship isn't limited to the scheduled times and space that we give it. Discipleship is always happening. I want to invite you to see every moment as a discipleship opportunity. Moments are the as you're going discipleship that happens throughout the day. You know, those real life moments where you get to reinforce what you've discovered during your minutes. It's the things like reviewing the week or month's memory verse together while riding around town or pausing to talk and pray when emotions arise say, frustration or anxiousness, and everything in between. The essence of moments is being attentive and alert to those random opportunities to talk about God, His character, and what He is doing in your lives. Number three is milestones. Milestones are the significant moments and markers in the life of your child and family. So birth, first days of school, maybe pre-K graduation, losing a tooth, birthdays, baptism, things like that. These milestones give us a special opportunity to celebrate and remember the Lord's work and faithfulness. And milestones are where we teach kids to notice that these different significant markers are actually evidence of God's goodness and love for us. So we're not just simply celebrating a milestone. Yay, it's the first day of school but we're celebrating God's goodness on display in that milestone. So there are a few different ways that we celebrate milestones in Kid City, and that's through the gift of a storybook Bible and baby believer primer at birth, an NIRV Bible when you're moving up to kindergarten, end of the year celebrations, birthday cards, and of course, baptism. Now the greatest milestone that we ever experience is that moment when we commit our lives to Christ and receive His incredible gift of salvation. Our role as disciples is to plant seeds of truth, to water them and pray that God will give them life and growth as we trust in His goodness and mercy. 
Our hope is that building a solid foundation of scripture through our minutes, living this out at home together in the moments and milestones, your child will become hungry for Jesus and commit their life to him. So along with our Three Steps Forward Discipleship Plan, you'll receive a weekly way to guide and engage with your minutes, moments, and milestones. They'll be in your hand, they'll be in your email inbox, and on our Kids City social media pages. Now our prayer is that the Lord would use our Three Steps Forward, those minutes, moments, and milestones, to empower families in raising up disciples, help them to grow closer in Christ boldly pursue God and community, and for Jesus to be Lord over every household and heart. Thanks. So that's the Kid City card, minutes, moments, and milestones. I had to laugh when she talked about some of the milestones, like losing your first tooth. That's not quite the same milestone when you're on the other end of the spectrum from Kid City. Um, but for a kid, that's a big, big deal. So minutes, moments, and milestones are how they're going to Use that card to really help families to root in a rhythm of discipleship. And the three steps for Epic are read, reflect, and focus. Read, reflect, and refocus. And that's the, car, the kind of the, 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 the rhythm and the pattern that Epic kids are going to um, center around this year as they really get themselves rooted in discipleship. And for adults, it's contemplation, confession, and communion. And these cards are designed to follow whatever your small group, your life group is doing. If you've not yet found your way into a life group, there are some uh, kind of general cards on those back tables and also at the welcome station for you to pick up. If, um, the whole point of this is to disciple people to follow Jesus. If you want a city that looks like the kingdom of God, disciple people to follow Jesus. And I wanna give you a little bit of motivation in that direction. China, as if we haven't heard enough bad news already, um, here's one more for you, to, um, just, just to kind of give you the, kind of the gravity of the way things are moving in the world in recent months. And on July 1st, China celebrated, if you can call it celebrating, 100 years of communism. 100 years of communism. And they, um, they if you thought Chinese communism and socialism were dead, you are wrong. It's, it's, it's actually, to underscore the point, I think, in the last three years, this is not, this is not for a, a long, this is in the last three years especially, China has dramatically increased the persecution and containment of all religious activity. That's leaders of Falun Gong, Islam, and Christianity, not just Christians, because they say religion is not in keeping with socialist values. And sadly, that, exp that extends to Hong Kong. And that is really sad, because Hong Kong has not always been there. They were separate and under, the, under British rule until 1997, but in the last few years, China has really clamped down on religious freedom in Hong Kong as well. So thousands of churches, in the last three years, thousands of churches have been closed. Thousands of religious leaders have been either detained or imprisoned or tortured, or in some cases, they're, they're, they have been executed by means of organ excision. That's how they've been executed. Bibles are now harder to find. Bible apps have been banned. Minors are not allowed to attend church in China. They call it cynicizing religion. Um, cynicizing means making something Chinese. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but a according to Nina Shea um, of Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom, she's a voice we can respect. Cynicism is, or cynicizing religion in China has actually gone to a really insidious place. Beijing has an agreement with an American publishing, Bible publishing company to publish a cynicized Bible, which is to say <laughs> it will take all the Christian out of the Bible and make it just Chinese. For the, for, for the current Chinese regime, that means making it socialist. So we have to wonder what will be left out and, and will it even be our Bible anymore? The question I'm left with is this. Why do they care about our Bible if our Bible holds no power? Yeah. 
In fact, I think our Bible does hold power. So when we talk about things like corporate worship or um, the importance of Christian community or the importance of knowing the word of God, friends, friends we're not just talking about um, Christianese culture markers. In other parts of the world, people are dying for these rights and they're holding the line for these rights in a way that humbles me. These are followers of Jesus who get it, that if you want a city to look like the kingdom of God, you have to disciple people to follow Jesus. In fact, I want you to read this with me. Let's read it together. Ready? Go. If you want a city that looks like the kingdom of God, disciple people to follow Jesus. And that's the same for a, for a country, for a culture, for a family, for a household. If you want it to look like the kingdom of God, disciple everybody inside of it to, to follow Jesus. I want that idea to stay in your mind as we talk through this three, three steps forward process. It's meant to be more than just another good idea. This isn't one of those you know, church things that you pull out in the fall so everybody kind of gets on board again. We're not under the illusion that reading the Bible is all there is to becoming a disciple. We're not under that illusion at all. Like if I read my Bible, is that all I have to do, right? That's all God needs me to do. Not exactly. Actually, we're talking about how to become God's ambassadors. That's what we're talking about. So that the world we live in can experience in the midst of a really hard time the life and goodness of God because, as Christopher said last week, it is a righteous desire to long to make a better world. Let me get an amen, folks. It is a righteous desire to long to make a better world. But every journey has a starting point, and then the journey of discipleship, understanding the character of God, learning the voice of God, knowing the story of God, all that happens in the context of Scripture. When I was 28 years old, I came back to Jesus, and I, I was in church a little bit, but I was just barely Christian, you know, like I was in church, that was kind of it. And then a friend of mine kind of tricked me into going to a Bible study, and I started going to this Bible study, and I remember when we first started going to the Bible study, it was like, man, these guys are way too fanatical for me. They're way too regimented. I was not that kind of, you know, do things like the spirit. Um, but I did it. I did it, and it was amazing. It wasn't the regimenting or the system that they used that was the secret, but it was getting me to sit down every day with the Bible that opened it up for me. And I can remember still today sitting down with my Bible at my kitchen table and seeing the Word of God come to life for me. It was the first time in my life that it happened, and I'd, I'd been a pretty involved youth when I was a teenager, and I'd been a religion major in college, but for the first time in my life, I felt the Bible come alive. And Steve started going to Bible study too because, as he said, he didn't want to be left behind. He said husbands are the original left behind story. You know, they don't want to be left behind when their wives get all um, excited about, uh, about Jesus again. And so um, we started growing together. And as we grew closer to Christ, we grew closer to each other. And, and then this call to preach resurfaced a call I'd had as a teenager. But this time it happened in the context of a scriptural call to go and make disciples. It was wrapped up in all the other stuff we were learning. So obviously, Bible study is not where we stopped, but it is where we started. This is where we began to hear God speak on his own terms about who we are, how he designed us, what he's called us to be and to do, and how he planned to use us for the welcome and advance of the kingdom of God. So as we said last week, scripture contemplation is about hearing, that's step one, scripture contemplation is about hearing God speak his intended message through the scripture. It's about trying to understand scripture, about trying to understand God on his own terms. 
As we, and we began last week and we, we tried an example. Do you remember last week? It was a long time ago, but do you remember? We sat in here and we sort of made ourselves a little small group and we used Genesis chapter one through the first couple of verses of chapter two, the whole creation story, and we, and we asked a couple of important questions of the scripture. It's, the, it's step one of those three steps forward for adults. The first question is, what does this reveal about God and his mission? And the second question is, what does this reveal about the people of God? So both of those questions are really meant to talk, talk about God. So we, we talked about, in the context of that story, God's creativity, God's goodness, God's rest, and about God's desire to bring peace into our chaos, rest into our restlessness, and by asking those two simple questions of the story, we, we learned a lot of really good things about God last week. That's step one in the three steps forward, contemplation. Listening to the scripture to learn more about God on God's terms. Step two is confession. Now, usually we think about confession as, you know, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned, and then we blah out everything that's horrible in our lives, and, you know, and it comes complete with shame and guilt and all that stuff, but that's really not the way I see confession. I see confession really as a freedom gift. It's, it's clearing the air, it's bringing everything into the light that I n- know I need to have reconciled in my life. Um, so, I, you know, it's, 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 it's not just and, and, and. Confession is not just where I've gotten it wrong because, you know, we, we talk about confession of faith. And, and my, the confessions of my, of my places where God has worked in my life, that's a confession. And so confession is also about where, not where I, just where I got it wrong, but also where I got it right. And it's confessing the places where I need God's grace, where I can, where I can grow, the places where I can move forward in my life. All of that, all of that is confession. So that's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna take three confessional questions and apply them to the same scripture passage we used last week, Genesis 1, the story of the creation. And here are the three questions. Where am I missing it? Where am I getting it right? And what's the grace that I need? Where am I missing it? Where am I getting it right? And what's the grace that I need? So I'm gonna ask Don to come up. And, um, and, and let's just talk about these questions for a minute. If you can put the questions on the screen for me, that'd be great. So where am I missing it? Where am I getting it right? There they are. What's the grace that I need? Good questions, aren't they? They are good questions. Um, they take what we've seen in the story, I mean, what we've learned about God, and they help us to bring it home, to, to deal with it personally, at, w- it's, to deal with it like as the intersection between of God and us, right? <laughs> That's what, we're, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the intersection of the kingdom and us. So Don Harris is gonna read uh, the same story for us from Genesis chapter one from a version called The Voice. We picked a different version this week, mostly John, uh, Don chose it just because it, 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 it brings things out in the story that we never could have heard in the other version. And I want you to listen to this version with those three questions in mind. Where am I missing it? Where am I getting it right? And what's the grace that I need? In the beginning, God created everything, the heavens above and the earth below. Here's what happened. At first, the earth lacked shape and was totally empty, and a dark fog draped over the deep while God's spirit wind hovered over the surface of the empty waters. Then there was the voice of God, let there be light, and light flashed into being. God saw that the light was beautiful and good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. Evening gave way to morning. That was day one. And God said, let there be a vast expanse in the middle of the waters. Let the waters above part from the waters below. So God parted the waters and formed this expanse, separating the waters above from the waters below. It happened just as God said. And God called the vast expanse sky. Evening gave way to morning. That was day two. 
And God said, let the waters below the heavens be collected into one place and congregate into one vast sea so that dry land may appear. And it happened just as God said. God called the dry land earth and the waters congregated below seas. And God saw that his new creation was beautiful and good. And God said, earth, sprout green vegetation, grow all varieties of seed-bearing plants and all sorts of fruit-bearing trees. And it happened just as God said. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants of all varieties and fruit-bearing trees of all sorts. And God saw that his new creation was beautiful and good. Evening gave way to morning. That was day three. And God said, lights, come out, shine in the vast expanse of heaven's sky, dividing day from night to mark the seasons, days, and years. And lights, warm the earth with your light. It happened just as God said. And God fashioned the two great lights, the brighter to mark the course of day, the dimmer to mark the course of night. And the divine needled the night with the stars. God set them in heaven's sky to cast warm light on the earth, to rule over the day and night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that his new creation was beautiful and good. Evening gave way to morning. That was day four. And God said, waters swarm with fish and sea creatures. Let birds soar high above the earth in the broad expanse of sky. So God created huge sea creatures, all the swarm of life in the waters and every kind and species of flying birds, each able to reproduce its own kind. And God saw that his new creation was beautiful and good. And God spoke this blessing over them. Be fruitful and multiply. Let creatures fill the seas. Let birds reproduce and cover the earth. Evening gave way to morning. That was day five. And God said, earth, generate life, produce a vast variety of living creatures, domesticated animals, small creeping creatures, and wild animals that roam the earth. It happened just as God said. God made earth creatures and a vast variety of species, wild animals, domesticated animals of all sizes and small creeping creatures, each able to reproduce its own kind. God saw that his new creation was beautiful and good. And God paused. Then God said, now let us conceive a new creation, humanity, made in our image, fashioned according to our likeness. And let us grant them authority over all the earth, the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the domesticated animals and the small creeping creatures on the earth. So God did just that. He created humanity in his image, created them male and female. Then God blessed them and gave them this directive. Be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth. I make you trustees of my estate. So care for my creation and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and every creature that roams across the earth. The crown of God's creation is a new creature, a creature that can sound the heartbeat of its creator. That creature, made male and female, reflects God's own relational richness. The human family is to join God in the ongoing work of creation. The earth below and the sky above with all their inhabitants are too beautiful and too good to be left alone. They need the tender care and close attention that only God's favored creature can give. And God says to humanity, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant that grows on the earth and every fruit-bearing tree. They will be your food and nourishment. As for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and every small creeping creature, everything that breathes the breath of life, I have given them every green plant for food. And it happened just as God said. Then God surveyed everything he had made, savoring its beauty and appreciating its goodness. Evening gave way to morning. That was day six. 
So now you see how the Creator swept into being the spangled heavens, the earth, and all their hosts in six days. On the seventh day, with the canvas of the cosmos completed, God paused from his labor and rested. Thus God blessed day seven and made it special. An open time for pause and restoration, a sacred zone of Sabbath keeping, because God rested from all the work he had done in creation that day. So much good stuff comes out when you get to hear it in a different version, doesn't it? It's really good. Um, so I'm curious, hearing it in that version, I, I probably I don't have time to hear more than just one or two, but does anything new bubble to the surface about the story itself before we get to the questions? So the hovering over the waters with wings, yeah, the hovering with the wings, there was just the sense of the animation of that hovering was really, that's a cool thing to hear, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Anything else? All right, let's jump into the uh, the, the, these three questions. Last week, the, story, the questions were about the story itself, but this week, the story is the same, but the questions are about us, and that makes it more personal. You're going to want, you're going to be tempted to answer these questions in the plural, but I'm going to challenge you to answer them a, a, in the first person. Um, these, these are a little more vulnerable, especially the first one, where am I missing it? But I want you to remember that our task is to let this bit of scripture speak to us about our lives, so it's almost like we're having a conversation with the Bible. We're letting it tell us something about ourselves we might not have recognized otherwise. And we're trusting that the Holy Spirit is doing the speaking as we think about what the Holy Spirit is, I mean about what the scripture is teaching us and, and, and about where we're missing it. So I'm wondering if anybody has an initial thought on where you're missing it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. That's really well said. That's really well said. So what she said is that it's it, it all sounds so much like a fairy tale that it's easy to miss the awesomeness and the wonder of it. And in fact, you, you could find yourself over time living in this world that is such a magnificent creation, sort of numbing yourself to the beauty that's around you. So really, really good thought. Someone else? Becky. So you miss it by focusing on words instead of tending the creation. Okay, uh, yeah, so focusing inward instead of focusing on the creation around you. Yeah, so, so I get, when I get focused inward, all of a sudden, ever, my world closes down. When I focus on the creation, my world gets a lot bigger, and the provision looks a lot more possible, doesn't it? Really good word, really good. One more. Yes. So where does that come down to where you're missing it? Because I, for me personally, uh -huh. view, um, well, things that I need great allowances for my creativity, and so it's put that to me personally. So structure, I don't like structure because I view that as a place that negates creativity. So With that's a really good point. If we can rebel against the created or against the order that is inherent in creation, we can find ourselves rebelling against that because we think, well, we don't want anybody squelching all the creative juices, right? And so where we can miss it so often is in appreciating that life also needs to have order and structure to it. That's a great point. That's a great point. 
So I'm a, I'm a really good, big fan of this kind of confession. I mean, I'm a 12-step person, so I, I like confession. I, I think there's something about saying it out loud. It brings all the junk into the light, and John chapter 3 tells me that everything in the light belongs to Jesus. Everything in the dark belongs to the enemy, so get it in the light so that Jesus has it. And so we can acknowledge the pain, and we can pinpoint the issues that need to be dealt with, and we can do it with the language of Jesus and not the language of the enemy of our souls, which is shame and guilt. That's not the language of this kind of confession. It's the language that says, Lord, we just need to, we, I, I, need, I need you to see where I'm missing it so you can help me get it right. So this isn't about saying, God, I've been bad. It's really saying, Lord, I'm beginning to understand myself as a sinner who is a deeply loved child of God by the sheer grace of God. So I always say that confession is freedom. It's our way of making sure the enemy does not get the last word. So when I listen to Genesis chapter one these days, I want you to tell you, I want to tell you where I hear myself missing it because I, I really want to be vulnerable because I want to encourage you to this kind of vulnerability in your own group and in your own personal time. And, and where I hear it is in the way that work is described. Um, we're told that God made us rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and all creation. And a little further down in chapter three, we remember that God gave us the land to work. In fact, in the voice version, there's this beautiful section when he made humans and he made them, you know, we're, we're, we're co-creators with God in the work of stewarding creation. And it's a beautiful uh, expression of that particular section of that story. So on the creation side of Genesis 3, remember Genesis 3 is when the fall happened. So, but on the creation side of Genesis 3, work is meant to be good. It's part of creation, part of God's creative, joyful spirit. And to the extent that I turn it into an obsession or a tyranny or worse yet, an idol or an identity, I miss it. Everything goes sideways. My life starts to feel so much like this statement from Gordon Dahl. That he, says, he says, most middle class Americans tend to worship their work, to work at their play, and to play at their worship. That sounds familiar to me, at least the first two pieces of it. I tend to live on the Genesis 3 side of work, not really thinking of it as tyranny so much as, as too much my, of my identity. I do that to the detriment of my own health, to the detriment of those around me who are learning from me. And so restoring it, getting myself back to the creation side of Genesis 3, uh, it doesn't mean quitting work. It means, it means learning to bring play to my rest and rest to my work. Because here's what happens when we make work into tyranny. Now then our rest becomes just trying to recover from the exhaustion. So when everything is ordered correctly, then work becomes my Part of, part of one of the ways that I live out my creative design and then, uh, then rest becomes play and work becomes rest and worship is worship. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're learning to do that lately um, in our, and even in this community, we've kind of had this thought with the whole two-year uh, vision plan, you know, we need to build some fun back into um, because nothing sucks the fun out of life like a pandemic. Can I get an amen? So we need some times just to have some fun. So we've been encouraging people, just have some people to your house for no other agenda than to play with each other and laugh with each other and enjoy each other and, um, um, and, 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 and eat some good food together. You know, have two or three people who you know are well. Just, just enjoy each other because here's the thing. We've argued enough. Let me get an amen. We have distanced enough. I need an amen. But have we loved enough and laughed enough as part of bringing healing into the world? And could it be that healing happens in the restoration of creativity and play? So that's the first question. The second question, where am I getting it right? 
People who do these questions tell me that folks who have a real, who struggle with their self-esteem, they really struggle to answer this question. They want to answer it backwards. But like, well, I'll tell you a place I don't get it right. But no, there's actually a place for saying, here's where I, I not we, I am getting it right, or I am learning to get it right. Because, you know, getting it, here's where I'm missing it, and here's where I'm getting it right. Those are just two sides of the same coin, right? If I, once I realize where I'm missing it, now I can start getting it right, and I should start getting it right. It's a testament to what the Holy Spirit's doing in my life. So, um, so where are you getting it right as you read the creation story? Give me one or two. Yes, Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. That's really nice. Chuck, so I want to hear, I'll just rephrase it, frame a couple of things that you've just said. First of all, Chuck's in a small group. So that's one place where Chuck is getting it right. <laughs> Chuck's in the small group every week, and he's really s serious about the that about his group. And and as he said, it's it's different when the, it's being taught to you than when it's you're absorbing it and you're listening to it inductively. That's what we're doing right now. It's inductive Bible study. When you're listening to it inductively, the Holy Spirit speaks, and you begin to hear things. And I, I like what you said. You said it, it's personally satisfying. He's letting the story satisfy him. That is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Amen. That's beautiful. All right, give me one more. Where am I getting it right? There you go. So a growing, he, he, Chris is saying he's, he's got a growing appreciation for God's order and, and a growing appreciation for how following a process can actually lead to grace <laughs> or can actually produce grace in your life. It requires some patience. It requires the fact that this is a process, not a moment. All my problems won't get fixed in a minute. But if I follow a process, then I will, I will, I will find myself in God's grace. That's beautiful. So let me give you a little bit more vulnerability, okay? Something, and this is kind of vulnerable, but is it okay if I tell you something that's a little bit more personal? Because you guys know, most of you, if you I've, you've been here maybe when I've shared that I've been dealing with vertigo. I've been dealing with it for a while, like several years. And it seems to have gotten worse this year. Um, and, and it's a way, after I've gotten it pretty wrong, I need to say that I've, I've actually... I've, I have allowed stress to do a number on my health, <laughs> and that's a way I've gotten it wrong. But I'm learning to let creation become a part of my healing. One of the things about vertigo is that there's like there's a dozen different kinds of vertigo, and depending on which kind, you attract you address it very differently. Well, I've I finally, with the help of a of a specialist, um, found a diagnosis that sounds right to me. It's it's migraine. It's a way that migraine shows up. And that actually fits a bunch of other things that happen to be happening. And so understanding my vertigo as migraine means that I now know there, that there's a, there, there are a lot of triggers to migraine. They give you this long list of, of no foods, like foods you cannot eat. And, um, and, and I'm also discovering that barometric pressure is a real problem for me and so are hot showers who could have known that and and so uh, and the grocery store can be a real issue I'd never had that problem before but Susan and Bill Ritchie God bless their souls rescued me from the grocery store last week when I couldn't get out and um, and so all all of these issues and and on this no list right can make you feel like um, it, it, like there's nothing, like the world is an enemy. 
But with migraine, food is also a healer. I end up eating a lot of natural foods that are good for me, and sunlight is good for me, and cold water is good for me, and I've learned that the yes list is still a whole lot longer than the no list. <laughs> So yes, food can be a trigger, but food can also heal. And weather can be a trigger, but light and water can heal. And as I listen to this creation story, I'm telling you guys, this all happened to me just this last week. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to fit my story into a, an, ex, an, an illustration. I found hope last week listening to this story. I, I, I listened to it, I am reminded that God made plants for me. He made light for me. He made other humans with all their gifts and skills and their ability to diagnose their, my issues for me. <laughs> and this creation story reminds me to let all that God has given me, all that God has created for me, become part of my, of my body becoming whole and holy. And my story and my little life, I now see it. It's like, well, I'm like a little microcosm of the gospel. Because where we've missed it and really getting the good news about Jesus Christ is when we have focused on the no list, right? When we've turned Christianity into a long list of don'ts. When Jesus, holiness is actually much more about the yes list. Come on, people. <laughs> about the, the freedom from and the freedom to lists. About the places where we're getting it right the gospel is so much more about what Jesus is asking us to do right than what he is asking us not to do that's wrong. And creation, yeah, that's what the creation story is all so positive. And that's why, Lynn, it feels like a fairy tale because before the fall, it was. <laughs> before the fall, it was paradise. Before the fall, it was beauty and, and glorious and goodness, and there was no downside. Amen. And then somebody had to go and eat a trigger food. <laughs> and here's the coolest part about my story. All of this from Genesis 1. All of this hoping to inspire you to find your own story inside the story of God. The same sensitivity that makes me more susceptible and sensitive to creation also makes me sensitive to the creator. The same sensitivity that makes me sensitive to creation also makes me sensitive to the God who spoke a call into my life at 13, who restored that call at 30. And it is that sensitivity that constantly sends me looking for the supernatural power of God in this life. Do you see how it works? God's story can reframe our stories. That's what this practice is all about. It's about helping you to see your story in light of God's story so you can then receive the grace you need to reframe your story as a yes story. So what's the grace you need in your life this week in order to receive a supernatural yes? Does anybody have one? What's the grace that you need? Chris needs the grace of Sabbath. Noted, his supervisor says. All right, somebody else. Give me one more. In light of the creation story, what's the grace that you need? If God says it, it will be. If God says it, it will be. Yes. So you need the grace. If God says it, it will be. You need the grace to trust that, right? I need faith enough to trust that if you've said it, God, even if it's not here now, it will be here eventually. Amen. This is a question in itself. What's the grace that I need? It's so full of grace, isn't it? It's not a shame-based question. It's not an I'm not getting it right question. This is the kind of question you ask when you, the created one, are in the trusting presence of your creator. It is an admission of your humanity, but also of the profound truth that God is for us. 
God stands ready to pour out grace. Think of the cross as a, as a vessel that is just waiting to be tipped over, pouring out grace. So the, so the question three prayer is this. You, Lord, are the one who gives grace, and I'm the one who needs it. And here's the place where I need it most. This thing right here. Can you help me here so I'm not alone in this thing? That's a powerful thing. Where do you need grace this week? Yeah, the Bible, as we said, it's not the end game. It's not the place. You're not supposed, we're not supposed to sit down in a Bible study and make it Christian recreation. A lot of middle class American Christianity is that. We fill our lives with Christian recreation and the world never gets changed by that. The world doesn't get changed by that. But it is a place to start because until you hear the voice of God, until you know the story of God, until you really understand what God is trying to do in the world, how could we possibly become part of the transformation of the world? If you want your city, if you, if you want a city that looks like the kingdom of God, disciple people to follow Jesus. I'm gonna pray for you and then we're going to receive the grace of communion together. If you need one of those little COVID cups, you can just raise your hand where you are and somebody will, f will, will find you, actually. Um, I need to ask for, um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to receive communion together, and we're going to use this time, this space, to, to, to receive grace I invite you uh, into the story of God right now. Close your eyes, bow your head. <laughs> Lord, you're the one who gives grace and I'm the one who needs it. I know that um, I've got kind of my own little stuff going on in my own little life. And I, Jesus, I'm just thinking about what Becky said. It's so true. When I get all introspective and intro, introverted and um, interiorly focused, it's all, my world gets too small. Ah, Jesus, I'm so sorry. <laughs> when, I, when I think about the vastness of your creation, when I look at what you're capable of, I'm humbled. And I'm also a little embarrassed that I don't draw on that power more often. You, the most creative being in the universe, surely you are able to handle what is going on in my life. Surely you're able to handle what's going on in this world. Surely you are able. This week, I need grace, and you're the one who's got it. So I want to pray, Father, for myself, and I want to pray for my friends. Jesus, give us the grace to confess so the enemy does not get the last word on our lives. I don't want him to have the last word. I sure don't want him to have the, the word of shame or guilt or desperation or hopelessness or fear or anxiety. I don't want that word spoken over my life. God, I refuse those words. They're not kingdom words. I refuse them. I want you, Jesus, to have the last word just as you did when you were on the cross when you're able to say it is finished. Everything that was wrong is finished when grace poured out. Sin was overcome when grace poured out. Death was overcome when grace poured out. And so, God, I, pr I pray that you pour out grace over Afghanistan and over Haiti and over every sick person in the world who is hurting, dealing with COVID, especially those who are out of, uh, out of range of medical care. And I pray, God, for your grace over us in this room and over 
every individual person and over me. Grace, Jesus, your grace, Jesus, your goodness, your goodness, Jesus.